Welcome to The Third Space. This is a show we talk to innovators and tastemakers from all around the Bay Area. Why The Third Space? Well, outside of the home and office, the coffee shop is The Third Space. We ask our guests to take us to their favorite coffee shops where we have amazing conversation over coffee. Hi, my name is Faiza Farah and I'll be your host. Our guest today is Mark Bamuti Joseph, interdisciplinary artist, performer, poet, curator, and educator. He's currently serving as Chief of Program and Pedagogy at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. How's your, you had a dirty chai? Yeah, this is not um, with white coffee, this is chai with yes. a shot of espresso. But mostly I just like saying dirty. <laughs> An excuse going, yeah, I enjoy to just... coming into a coffee shop and saying both dirty and soy. <laughs> I grew up Catholic, you know, so. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. But you know, the sweet, the bitter. Yeah, 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 the spicy. Yeah, the spicy. That's good, that's yeah. good. That's kind of me. That is? Right it's you in a nutshell. It takes a <laughs> shell. <laughs> it's a whole this nut. Well, I want to start off kind of talking about, I guess first let's talk about where you're from. Where were you born? Where were you raised? Yeah, I was born in New York City. I was born in Queens um, and uh, lived all over. Went to school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. My best friend lived in the Bronx, so I was, mm. I was an all-city kid. Wow. Um, and uh, went to school in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to Morehouse College, all black, all male school. Um, in the South and um, left Atlanta and moved here to the Bay Area on a teaching fellowship. Wow. Um, that, was the, that was the swing. Um, it, it's important to say that I'm a first generation American, that my parents both immigrated to this country from Haiti. So um, I have um, that striver ethic yeah. um, and also the newness and promise of this country is not lost on me. At what point did you discover poetry and the arts? How um, old are you? Um, the arts probably all my life. Yeah. I think all my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like the first poem I wrote was for a girl. <laughs> it's always a girl. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but maybe the first time, and you know, when I was a kid, I was involved in commercial television and um, and theater was on Broadway when um, I was 10 wow. And, wow. Um, and through my, my teenage years. So um, there was definitely a pipeline for me in New York City into kind of high-end um, um, commercial arts. Um, but I feel like the first piece of art that broke me open was Entezaki Shange's um, choreo poem for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. And I have a memory of being 16 and on the F train um, reading that poem, this thin volume, about 70 pages, and um, using the book to like cover my face so that the rest of the people on the train, on the subway, wouldn't see me crying. Like that was the first piece of art that broke me open. And maybe the first time I understood that art could do more than entertain. Um, and her particular form, this intersection of, um, of text and movement, the understanding that the body is of language, right? That's, um, that's really what steered me in the direction that I move in aesthetically right now. When do you go from just kind of enjoying, consuming, and then creating yourself? Yeah. Um, what happened after that was the choreography that, and the choreographers that I was working with as a teenager, um, you know, there was a, I grew up at the same place in the same time that hip hop was, was growing up. So a lot of the choreography that I was involved in was like a lot of like <laughs> scoop and scrap, you know what I'm saying? Like behind Kwame, behind <laughs> Big Daddy K, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Just, just like kid and play, you know, there's a lot of kid and play, at the, you know, at the spotty. Um, but I would just apply text. I would just apply kind of figurative language and moved in a more, um, it, it, more in the tradition of, let's say, um, Donald Byrd was a huge influence growing up. Mm. Bill T. Jones was a huge influence growing up. I, I just 
kind of um, moved in this direction of, of modern choreography. Um, and that was supported, you know, when I was at Morehouse, I did a lot of West African dance. When I moved mm. here to the Bay Area, there was a lot of Cuban folkloric and Haitian mm. folkloric movement. And the application of text um, kind of went along with that. I was really blessed in um, 1999, I was part of a Poetry Slam team that won the National Poetry Slam. And um, what that meant um, was that at a very young um, age, relatively speaking, in my artistic arc, that the, that the form of the three minute poem, it's not that it was exhausted, but having kind of, at the time there was no deaf poetry, there was, you know, there was no kind of um, ubiquitous vis visibility around Poetry Slam. So winning the National Poetry Slam, like that was the thing that you could do. Right. And having done that, um, I then sought to take poems and take poetry and do a little something more than what was possible standing behind a microphone for three minutes. Um, so, um, you know, my, my good fortune was that um, I started making these five-minute choreo poems and then ten-minute choreo poems, and that work began to get commissioned. Um, and pretty soon, I found myself doing evening-length shows, combining wow. text and movement um, in high-visibility places. And were they like one-man shows, or did you have a crew and a cast? And always a crew, always collaborators, mm -hmm. even though I was doing kind of most of the running, sweating, talking, dancing, but I had amazing collaborators from the very beginning. I've, I've worked both in this kind of um, solo tradition with collaborators and more ensemble with collaborators, um, and now I find myself um, working with symphonies, ballets, operas. Um, you know, I, I talked about Bill T. Jones as a primary influence. Right. I'm now making an opera with him called We Shall Not Be Moved for Opera. Of course, you are. Of <laughs> course like he's, you are. He's directing it. I'm writing the libretto, and his brother Daniel Bernard Romain is, um, uh, is uh, scoring wow. uh, the, the opera. So, um, you know, I still do three, four, five minute poems where it's just me, and then I also work with um, these kind of larger companies. Uh, so how does, how do the things like Youth Speaks and mm -hmm. Life is Living kind of show up in your life? Yeah, so there's no, um, there's no way I think that, um, well here. So um, I believe that art works on the edge of reasoning. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, whatever kind of like common consciousness, um, whatever concept of normal we currently have, um, the, the people that are most likely to transcend that are astrophysicists <laughs> and artists. Right. You know, um, right. people that um, kind of make dream for a living mm. and people whose consciousness is always among the stars. Right. So, um, you know, I believe in making the dreamers thrive among us, mm. and um, but what that also means is um, a dream of a more equitable, accessible, um, thriving community that's right. built on inspiration. Right? right. The community is definitely a part of that. It's a yeah. big part of that. Yeah. So you can't just like make poems or make dances right. because they're pretty. Right. Right. There has to be um, some network of accountability, I think, right. that grounds um, yeah. any kind of uh, um, aesthetic aspiration that we have. Right. And that's the functionality of it. That's the functionality of it. Yeah, so um, right around 1999, there are NATO tanks in the streets of the former Yugoslavia, and um, there's a philanthropist that um, found a brother named James Cass and me and invited us both to take part in um, a movement in the former Yugoslavia called Youth Against War. And he had us working with um, Kosovar Gypsy Kids, um, Croats and Serbs using poetry to bring them together to have them tell their stories and kind of rediscover common ground in this place that had been um, segmented, separated, um, and violently affronted by ethnic differences. Um, and so that idea that we could use the personal narrative um, as international diplomacy 
um, felt like it also made sense here in Oakland or in San Francisco in the Bay Area where um, set tripping is a, is a common occurrence. Mm -hmm. And though there aren't tanks in the streets, you know, sometimes it feels like there might be um, oh, at any minute. So that's really the place that You Speaks was born out of, or You Speaks thrived in, is this sense that we could use the young person's personal narrative as a source of both self-discovery mm. and then uh, the application of healing, um, but also in a climate of thriving hip-hop culture where folks weren't necessarily, um, you know, young people in particular weren't necessarily drawn to the commercial aspects of hip-hop right. culture, there was a way to use language um, with depth, you know, depth and sincerity mm and also skill, you know what I mean, and, um, um, and be affirmed for that. So, um, so I stayed with Youth Speaks doing that kind of work in very many permutations. We created a, a national poetry festival called Brave New Voices, mm. and beginning in 2007, 2008, we worked with Russell Simmons to document the Brave New Voices work. Mm. Um, and um, that work showed up on HBO and, um, you know, had an amazing time working with You Speaks. And I would say that the other kind of large-scale project for me that came out of that time was Life is Living, um, which is a series of one-day festivals that we hold in under-resourced parks that are devoted to um, hip-hop, environmental action, and peaceful urban living. And the first Life is Living was held not so far away from here in West Oakland at Little Bobby Hutton Park. And they continue to be, I think, a landmark, certainly here in the town, for um, what black joy might look like at scale. And what a historical park. Yeah, about It's where time. the Black Panther Party it's had their free. It's where the Black Panther Party, exactly. It's where um, they gathered and um, where the free breakfast program right. of the Black Panthers um, kind of first uh, went off, um, you know, but as with many of our historical landmarks that um, are steeped in history as a result of both experiments and experience, um, the status quo or the state or city administration tends to neglect these spaces, mm -hmm. specifically where black history is made. Um, so, uh, you know, I think one of the great successes of Life is Living is that there's been, I, I, I would like to think that um, the amount of visibility that we gave to that park and the kind of the emblem that we were able to cultivate of thousands and thousands of people showing up in order to celebrate one another, you know, this isn't just an emblem or an indicator that social ecologies are just as important as physical ecologies. Mm -hmm. I think for city government, um, it also signaled that this was a park worth reinvesting in. Um, and so the cosmetic and infrastructural improvements that have been made to the park since we've been here are pretty profound, um, which probably means that it's time to move our act to another part of Oakland um, because you, you always want to be where resource is needed. Right. Um, and we have um, the resource of love. I want to know what you're working on now. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how it's placed in this particular time? Mm. Um, well, the, I'd like to think that my most important work right now are these large-scale affirmations of black joy mm. in the public realm. And um, I think that the landscape that you're talking about um, is one where the vulnerability and fear and persistent systemic attack on the black body is um, part of our nightly news. You know, for those of us that grew up in this country or for those of us who grew up in, you know, in this skin, in the African summer in the skin, <laughs> you know, existence, um, this isn't necessarily new, but right. when we talk about Sandra Bland or we talk about Walter Scott or we talk about Sam Ambrose or Trayvon Martin or Oscar Grant or you know, Mike Brown, you know, these, these names, these, um, these people who have become icons in our um, consciousness, I think have foregrounded um, a particular vulnerability, um, one in which the justice system has not corro corroborated um, with a sense of uh, 
um, our own collective humanity. And so, you know, a, the, the question that I think many of us are asking or many of us have asked is what's on the other side of um, the matter of black life? Like, um, can we frame the matter of black life in something other than rage or grief or right. mourning? Right. So, um, you know, with this in mind, um, I made recently uh, an installation, what I call um, a self-refracting, self-repairing second line for Gone Too Soon. Mm. Um, the installation was called Black Joy in the Hour of Chaos. It's Central Park. And it was in Central Park, worked with um, Creative Time, worked with um, a longtime collaborator, Brett Cook, on building mm. the visual emblem, and then worked with musicians, dancers, poets from all over, from New York and the Bay Area, in order to um, um, create this celebration um, under a red, black, and green parachute in the middle of the park. It was um, fairly extraordinary. It's kind of like durational work. Um, but that's prompted and kind of given a lens for me on just everything that I want to do in terms of the visual culture and visual identity of black life. You know, sometimes we talk in terms of counter narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that the narrative is expanded enough right. so that um, we create something like empathetic joy. Mm. So that in these times where income inequality is more insistent than ever, that um, when new cultures move into historically black neighborhoods, that there isn't this sense of um, market improvement based right. on like the cute coffee shop or, you know, the cute furniture store, right? That there's... Um, there's a sense that as neighborhoods become integrated in, in a different kind of way, that the matter of black life, that the humanity that's been historically present and the culture that um, comes out of that life is um, preserved, revered, affirmed, um, and evolved, right? So that we're not moving in and also displacing. So I think part of why we do that um, goes back to this thing of the edge of reasoning, right? Black artists have to normalize, I think, um, black joy in a different kind of way so that it's present in our collective consciousness so that, um, you know, these officers that aren't shooting at humans, that are shooting at tropes, you know, um, these um, real estate developers that are coming in and just kind of building on top of historic homes, you know, driven by um, a hyper-capitalist agenda, you know, maybe they won't be um, dissuaded from the violent action um, or, you know, the kind of the violent real estate-based action. Um, um, but perhaps if we continue to do this work artistically, um, there's a different normalized sense of our humanity mm. um, inside of our common consciousness. And um, I think that that's the artist's responsibility, is to bring us all to that place, to bring us to the edge of, um, of the status quo, to indicate what might be possible. Um, and so that's the work that Black Joy in the Hour of Chaos does. And that's what hopefully um, my new work, which is called Pelota, hopefully that's what that'll do as well. And why, why Joy? Why, why is that important? Um, you know, well, let me ask you, can you, um, could you describe Joy? I mean, it would be very difficult. Um, yeah. it, I, I would say that it's, I usually don't, realize it's happening until I, yeah. like my body's all the way in it and yeah. it's a kind of state of euphoria yeah. for me yeah. you know because I don't get to experience joy in my body that mm. often so there's a moment where I'm like smiling from within yeah. you know and really happy yeah. and I'm playing yes usually there's like a kind of yeah. playing that happens and yeah. then I know that I'm in it I've yeah. fallen into this kind of joy yeah yeah so that's it right <laughs> um, you know um, happiness is 
um, I, I think we all want happy. Right. We all veer towards happy. But there are also lots of ways that we can kind of like cosmetically or artificially produce happy. Mm. You can't artificially produce joy. Right. Right. Everything that you described, it's deep in the, it's deep in your body. Right. It's um, part of the marrow. So there's there's no way to artificially produce joy. Right. Do you know what I mean? There's there's um, there are many happy pills, and there are many. Um, there, there are many ways that you can kind of like swallow and affect happy, but joy is, you know, joy is in the blood, you know, joy is in the blood, it's in the marrow, it's, you know, it's deep in the body, and it's associated with play, and it's impossible to like fully describe, right? Right. So um, a, a question for me is, can I recognize joy in the other? Like, you know, I talk about black joy and this installation is called Black Joy in the Hour of Chaos, but if I were to flip it, if, you know, if a Latino artist came and made, you know, Colombian joy, you know, in the Hour of Chaos, could I connect to that? Could I, could I see and recognize joy in the other? Mm -hmm. And that to me is an exercise worth taking, you know, for as much as the environment means, as much as, mm -hmm social ecologies um, are important to me um, I believe that if we're going to survive the affects and manifestations of climate change that a consciousness that we have to develop is one of interdependence and nothing in our um, nothing in our economic makeup nothing in the way that we're thought to strive in our aspirations for success fosters a feeling of um, that interdependence or interdependent living mm. is part of our matrix for success. So if we're going to foster inter interdependence, we have to foster empathy. And so black joy isn't just an affirmation or joy itself isn't just an affirmation. It's also a call to arms. So it's a challenge for all of us to be able to actively seek undescribable emotion in the other mm -hmm. and if the art can start pointing that way then it's doing its job so every interview usually ends with uh, a show-and-tell piece and mm -hmm. the main reason talk speaking of joy yeah. a moment I experienced joy as a little girl was kind of bringing something to share with someone that mm -hmm. I really cared about mm -hmm. so I thought, hey, why not? Let's ask adults Let's to do, do show and tell. Cool. So, what did you bring for us? Um, so, I feel a little cheesy because I'm a writer and I brought <laughs> all this literary stuff. I think that's perfect. But, but these are these are the three um, kind of bound volumes that I'm bringing with me everywhere wow. right now. Um, the first is, um, I would call it. Um, a historical, a contemporary historical memoir. Mm. I don't know if he would call it that, but Ta-Nehisi Coates Between the World and Me. So good. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm bringing this everywhere is because um, having just read it, I'm reading it again, but this time um, my 13-year-old son is reading it with me. Oh, wow. um, and the, the book is positioned, it's framed as one long letter um, between uh, a, a, a one long letter from him to his 15 year old son so it's already an heirloom in my family mm. that's what we call future classic so I, I also that. brought some other, yeah. other stuff what else what else so this is Eduardo Galliano mm. soccer in sun and shadows let's see what's the bookmark in here there are hell of bookmarks <laughs> in here but soccer in sun and shadows um, Eduardo Galliano was um, an Uruguayan writer mm. who passed away this past um, April, just a tremendous mm. intellectual poet, um, novelist. Um, I'm obsessed with the global game. Mm. My next piece, Pelota, um, kind of looks at globalism, inequality, and the search for joy mm. through the lens of this game. And this is like my Bible right now. Wow. This is um, the prototype for the theatrical work that I want to make. It's a series of, it, it basically just looks at history and um, kind of um, a, a contemporary political and economic outlook through 
through the lens of the sport that I grew up playing and the sport that I love. So, inspiration, inspiration. Mm -hmm. And then this is where the inspiration goes. <laughs> Words, yes. lands. So I, I just celebrated my third uh, wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Um, thanks, and my wife gave me a journal. And she was like, man, I'm giving the writer a journal. <laughs> and so, you know, but I love it. I love it. So um, a lot of the inspiration from here goes here. Um, so I'm showing it and telling you um, where, it, <laughs> where it happens and where it goes. Thank you so much. Sweet. Thank you yeah. for being a guest. Yeah. It was such a pleasure talking Are to you. Are you kidding me, dude? <laughs> it's totally my pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Can I hug you? Yes, let's Thanks. do it. Bring it in. <laughs> Thanks for watching another episode of The Third Space. I had such a great time talking to Baluti. We had such a great conversation. He's so amazing. Um, you guys know what to do. Follow us, like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can also follow us on Instagram at the underscore third space. And we want to hear from you. So if you know of any interesting people that live in the Bay Area or come through the Bay Area that we should be speaking to, leave a comment below. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.